Pray. Let me pray before we dive into this. Father, thank you. Lord, again, we thank you for this season that we are in as a church, Lord. Thank you for uh, your word. God, thank you for the challenge, Father, that you are laying down to us this year, Father, to, Lord, renew our mind. And, Father, not to just sit back and be conformed and be, just marinate in the world and marinate in the way the world sees things and says things should be and so on. But, Father, the call to us as believers to renew our mind and to think more in line with the way you think and more in line with the way your word teaches us to think. So, Father, we take that challenge on board. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we look at this next aspect of that, Holy Spirit, would you speak to each individual person in this room? Would you speak to us in a way that we would understand? And Lord, would you highlight and speak to us whatever it is in this that, we, that you would like to get our individual attention on in these next few minutes, Father? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay. I'm going to see if I'm going to turn this technology on. Yep, so far so good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, I was putting this together this week, and to be honest, I thought that the last couple of weeks would have been the hardest ones to, the, the most opportunity to offend people. Um, those of you that uh, haven't uh, been with us for the journey, we started talking about renewing our mind from the perspective of the way we see ourselves and the way we see God and the church and so on. It was very internal. And then we moved, we took a hard left-hand turn and we started looking at things external to us outside there in the world. And we've been looking at some very sensitive cultural issues and I really appreciate the feedback I've been getting and the questions and so on. And we've looked at things such as a biblical definition of marriage. We've looked at same-sex uh, sexual relationships. We've looked at the issue of gender last week as well. So we've tackled some pretty tough ones and I thought, we got the tough ones out of the way. But then I sat down and looked at this one and thought, you know what, there might be more people that actually struggle with this one than any other one we've talked about so far. And what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about our attitude towards, dare I say it, hold it back, now I'm going to let it out, our attitude towards authority. Ooh. Our attitude towards authority. Uh, recently, I had this situation where, um, some of you would know this, I got fined. Anyone, I, I've, have I, did I share this story with anybody I got fined for parking in our own car park? Okay, if I did share the story with you, first thing I want to do is repent. Because I shared it to you with a very bad attitude, and the Lord convicted me of that. Alan, you did exactly what you're going to talk about today and say we shouldn't be doing. So public repentance first up. I, I, was, I, I did not handle that very, very well. Now, here's what happened. I came on into the car park here. When they opened up the street at the end here, so that's only recently been opened up in the last few months. And when they finally opened up the road, before that, this was a dead end, cul-de-sac. Then they opened it up, now the road goes straight through. And so the police decided which they have a right to do, that they would park in our car park and put their gun through the hedge and catch everybody speeding up the hill. And uh, I'd be in here some days and they'd just pull up with their gun and so on. And I didn't complain. Oh, that's fine. You want to park there and do that? People are speeding. That's fine. No dramas. Well, one day I came on in and instead of parking in between the lines like all you great people have done Sunday morning, I used to just drive in and park, pull straight up in front of the door here and just drive straight across the lines. Now, I've been doing that for as many years as we've been in this car park and not once have I got in trouble for it. All of a sudden, one day, the police officer came in because he was parking there too with his camera. Well, this day I beat him to my own car park, you see. And so he turned up and drove in, turned around and drove back out and disappeared. A couple of days later, I got a parking fine for parking across the white lines. And I'm... A little bit dirty about that. And so I start complaining and whinging and so on, and wanting to push back. And I even rang a friend of mine who was a lawyer and said, what can I do about this? This is wrong, you know. He's been doing it, and I've been doing it for ages. And it's a private car park. It doesn't matter. Well, guess what? Cut a long story short, it turns out that it does matter. Because if you go and look at the law, section 1.2.77-49-7-4PQ, upside down, L backwards, Z, <laughs> you'll see that even in this car park, Parking across the white lines is still considered illegal because it's considered a public car park. Now, who knew that? I did not know that, and I got away with it for eight years. Hey, hey, and I got busted once. And what I realised was, you know what? At the end of the day, take away all my attitudes and everything I did, the bottom line is he was well within his rights to find me. Instead of being angry for finding me once for parking like that, I should have been rejoicing and praising them. You didn't find me for eight years. Awesome. You guys are wonderful. But isn't it funny, we have this thing inside of us that likes to push back against authority. We have this anti-authoritarian spirit that is in the nation, I'll speak on behalf of our nation, I believe there's an anti-authoritarian spirit 
within our nation that likes to push back on any form of authority or any form of leadership. Every parent in the room, they're going to get an amen. Amen, amen. Kids are, uh, who knows that kids are more bold nowadays to push back on the authority of their parents than maybe kids were, hey, what would happen if Jackie pushed back on you the way that Chloe pushes back on Jackie? I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't have a wife. She wouldn't be here. I'd be married to somebody else, which means Chloe wouldn't be here. And, and who knows what would be happening? We live in an anti-authoritarian nation with an anti-authoritarian attitude and spirit towards it. Now, here's the thing. I could go many, many ways with this when I talk about authority. Uh, but what I want to do today is I just want to look at our attitude towards authority. What is our personal attitude towards authority? I'm going to focus on the idea of our submission to and our attitudes towards the earthly authorities that have been established over us in this life. So I pushed back and I tried to get out of that fine because I was ignorant of what the laws were around parking in our own car park. And apparently, obviously, I was very, very wrong and the officer was right. So how many of you know, how many of you agree we live in an anti-authoritarian culture? That we humans live under the illusion that we have the right to be our own bosses, that we actually are indeed our own bosses, how many of us freely slander authority figures without batting an eyelid? It's almost become a default natural response to any decision made by any authority that we don't like. We post things on social media and we thumbs up and, 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 and these emoji things to other people's posts to criticise authority or slander authority or dishonour those who are in authority. How many parents openly criticise their children's teachers in front of children? I see parents talking ill of teachers and they do it in front of their children. And, and in case you haven't noticed, there's an underlying theme in a lot of the things we're talking about. And that is I'm looking towards this younger generation and going, what is it going to be like for these kids in a generation's time if we continue to allow them to be exposed to and to see the things they're seeing today as normal? If they keep thinking that what's going on in the world around them is normal, what's it going to be like for them when they're older and when they're adults? We've got to be careful that we're not slowly teaching the next generation that authorities can't be trusted, that submission is no longer necessary, that leadership is outdated, especially also in the church because we all have the Holy Spirit, and that while respecting authority figures looks good on paper, you're actually not expected to do it in real life. So this is kind of where I want to bounce off from today because that's the message the world is throwing out there. That's the message of society that the world is being conformed into. But it's not the way of a renewed mind. If you've got a Bible there, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you today, but I'm going to try to get through it as quick as I can. The idea here is, as we've said from the start, I'm not telling you what to believe. I want you to think about what you believe. Okay? It's not my job to tell you what to believe. Most of us in this room know what we believe. We don't know why we believe it. And so part of this series has been, okay, here's, you, you probably agree with everything I'm saying, but do you know why you agree with it? Do you know what the Word of God actually says about that? Because the people who disagree with you, they know why they disagree. They'll even bring Scripture verses out and show you why they disagree. Why there's no such thing as male and female. They'll tell you why same-sex uh, attracted marriages should be legalized. They'll, and they'll pull Scripture verses and they'll tell you why. Because they know the whys of their arguments. Often we just know the what. But we don't really know the why. So the challenge here in renewing our mind is we need to start to get back into this collection of ancient documents and start looking at what does the Word of God teach about these things. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 23, this is Peter. Dear friends, I urge you as a foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, pagans being those outside of the family of God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Everybody say the Lord's sake. Why are we submitting ourselves? It's for the Lord's sake. What does Lord mean? Lord means he's the boss, right? He's the big B. He's the boss. He's the one that we submit to ultimately. And the one we submit to ultimately is saying, because you submit to me ultimately, I'm telling you, submit down here. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Everyone say, live as free people. 
What does it mean to live as a free person? He's going to tell us, live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Say, live as God's slaves. So to truly live as a free person means to live as God's slaves. So the way that we become truly free is by coming out from under everything else and placing ourselves under the submission of God. That's where humans find the ultimate freedom. It's like a fish. A fish is free. That doesn't mean that you can take a fish out of a bowl of water and throw him on the kitchen bench and say, be free, live, enjoy. Because he needs a certain environment for his freedom and liberty to take effect. And for us, we find the ultimate freedom and liberty when we're submitting ourselves under God. So we're living as free by becoming God's slaves. This is the wording that Peter uses. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Think about that. He's saying, don't just submit to, if you're a slave, I'm telling you, don't just submit to the masters who treat you well and with respect. I want you to submit to the ones that treat you harshly. Now, before anybody switches off there, he goes, but hang on a second, shouldn't we? I'm going to get to that, so please don't switch off. I'm going to answer your question towards the back end of this. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong? And endure it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Everybody say an example. Who's the example? Who's the example? Who? Who? Jesus. Christ. It says there that he, he, he suffered for us. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. As Christ followers, we're called to submit to worldly authority structures. Now, there's a lot in that passage, but I just want to pluck a few things out. Like I said, I just want to focus on our attitudes towards authority. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 14, here's what he says. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to Every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority. Now, when he says supreme authority, we know that Peter is speaking about earthly authorities, right? Because who was the supreme authority ultimately? God. Good answer. God is the supreme authority. So we know he's not speaking of spiritual things here. He's speaking of natural things, right? So he says naturally right now in the time and season he was living in, the supreme authority at that time was the emperor down here on earth. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent, catch catch this, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now, let me give you a bit of amazing background to this letter that Peter writes. Peter is currently in prison. He writes this letter from prison. He's in prison because he's preaching Jesus. So we talk about our religious freedoms and our religious liberties. This guy's in prison for preaching about Jesus, nothing else but declaring the story of Jesus. The emperor that he's speaking about at the time, anyone know who the emperor was? He's a guy called Nero. Anyone ever heard of Nero? Nero was not a good person. Nero had a very, very bad reputation. And at the moment that Peter's writing this, Nero is sitting on the throne. The one that he says to to the emperor as the supreme, he's speaking of Nero. He's writing to these people saying, you need to submit and, and respect this person that threw me in prison and ultimately, eventually, sent me off to my death. Think about that for a second. How many, of you, how many of us have ever sat back and thought, well, yeah, you, I'll, I'll, I can submit to authority when they're good people. I'll submit to authority when they start treating us better, when they start giving us our freedom. Go and talk to Peter. This is probably the worst experience of Christian persecution almost in the history of the church, back when Nero was the emperor. At this time, he was throwing Christians to lions. He was also feeding Christians to wild dogs. For what reason? Simply because they had a faith in Jesus. He was also burning them at the stake. He would get Christians and tie them to stakes and he would burn them alive. In fact, the entrance to the city, he would line them up because they had no electricity and electric lights. He would tie up Christians on poles and line the streets as you walked in. That's what lit up the road 
on the way into the city. This is barbaric, this is evil, and this is what's happening at the time when Peter's writing this letter and saying to us that we should, for the Lord's sake, submit to every human authority. And he goes on and says, that's to the supreme authority of the government. He says, because he's sent by God to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. How can Peter say that? How can Peter say that? Speaking of Nero, some ancient church historians, Eusebius said this, he said that Nero was the first that persecuted this doctrine. He was the first guy that went really, really hard after the church. A guy called Sepulchius Severus, he was a Christian writer, he said again that he was the first who began a persecution. Tertullian, who was an early church apologist and Christian and author, he said the first emperor who died his sword in Christian blood. I want you to keep this in mind when you read some of these letters. We, we, we think that we got it hard now. I don't think we've got it anywhere near as hard as what some of these guys had. It's amazing how little it takes for us to whinge and complain about authority. It's amazing how little, uh, uh, how little uncomfortableness we need to feel before we turn on our leaders. If here's this guy saying, hey, I'm in prison and this guy's going to kill me. Hey, I want you to submit and respect him. I want you to respect him. The point is this. Peter's writing into a culture and a time where the national leadership were not exactly exemplary. Nero was also emperor when Paul wrote to the Romans. And here's what Paul says to the Romans in Romans 13.1. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And when Paul writes to Titus, in Titus 3.1, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Remind the people. Remind the people. Why do you think he's saying remind the people? I reckon because much like today, we forget that God puts people in positions of authority. We forget that authority is God's idea, that authority is good. And we forget that. And so he says, and I can imagine in a culture where your friends and your family are being fed to lions and being fed to dogs and burned at stakes and so on, I can imagine that all the stuff that goes on on the inside, like we're going we're gonna to pay them back. We're, we're, we're going to get these guys. We're, we're going we're gonna to speak bad. We're going to slander. We're going to curse them. We're going to... And I can understand it because we're humans and we have emotions. I understand that I get it. And so Paul says here to Timothy, he says, you need to remind. Remind them. Remind them. And that's what I want to do today is just remind us. Remind us in the midst of everything that's going on and everything we've been talking about for the last few weeks, which a lot of it is linked back to decisions that are made by people in authority. And I want to remind us today that God places authority structures over us and he does it for a reason. And sometimes I really like it and sometimes I don't. But not how I feel about it is not the issue. It's where it comes from and it's what God is saying to me about that. It's the same with everything else we've talked about. We've tried to separate feelings from what does God's word say? What is God saying? And maybe some of us, we haven't struggled with feelings of same-sex attraction, so it's easy to go, yeah, that's right, don't, don't go down that path. But what about this one? What about this one? What about when authority figures over you don't do things the way you think they should? What about when they ask you to do things that you don't want to do? What's their attitude towards that? Because who are these guys writing to? They're writing to who? They're writing to the church. They're writing to Christians. They're not writing to people out there. See, people out there are going to go their own way and they're going to criticize and they're going to slander and they're going to want to rise up and they're going to want to rebel and all sorts of things. And that's fine. Let them do that. He's writing to us as believers going, you know what? You're different. You're meant to be different. And I don't know about you, but, uh, and I don't go on social media, but I've got friends that do and they tell me all the stuff that floats around out there. and Man... There's a lot of anti-authority sentiment out there. There's a lot of people passing on comments and statements and, 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 and high-fiving and thumbs-upping and all this sort of stuff. All this stuff that, to me, I look at it and go, you know what, that's going directly against what Scripture calls the church to be. And that is to be different. So, why would we do this? Why would we honour them when we don't like the leaders we have? 
But here's the thing, we're not commanded to necessarily like the leader, but we are commanded to respect the position that that person holds, the position of authority that those people hold over us. Uh, In Matthew 23, verse 1 to 3, Jesus made this statement. He said to the crowds and to his disciples, he said, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they have a position that they hold. Now, are all of them good? No. And he goes on and he says that. He says, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Be careful to do everything they tell you, but don't do what they do. He's separating the position from the people. And he's saying they sit in a a particular position of authority. They sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they've got that place of, of leadership and teaching over you. So I want you to listen and respect that position, but don't do what they do. He separates the position from the person. Paul did a similar thing in Acts chapter 23, verse 1 to 5. Paul honors the position that is over him, whether he likes the people or not. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and he says, My brothers, I fulfilled the duty of God in all good conscience to this day. He's in amongst the religious people. He's getting tried. He's getting uh, interrogated by this religious group. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me. Pretty heavy, isn't it? You whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. And those who were standing nearby said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replies, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it's written, and then he quotes Exodus 22, 28, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Oops, I overstepped the mark there. Sorry, I didn't realize this guy was the high priest. I should not have said what I said. It's interesting in Exodus 22 that that God actually places the cursing of rulers in the same sentence as blaspheming God. It says, do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. God's serious about authority. God's serious about us respecting the authority structures that are put above us. A great example of respecting the position, even when it's hard to respect the person, can be found in the life of King David. We all know that, 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 that Saul was the king and then Saul went off the wall. God removed his anointing and so on. And then David was going to be the king. And then Saul went after David. And David spends his time running and hiding in caves in the wilderness, trying to get away from Saul. And Saul is coming after him with one intention. And that intention is to literally kill him. And there's a moment in the life of King David where King David and his men are hiding in a cave. And it says that King Saul got off his horse because he had to go to the toilet. That's what it is. And so he goes into a cave to relieve himself. And watch what happens. He, while he's in that cave, David reaches up. He's so close to him. David reaches up and cuts a corner off his garment. And then Saul goes. And here's what it says. It says in 1 Samuel 24, 5 and 6, Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. I wonder how hard some of our hearts are, whether we have any conscience about the way we bag authorities and the way we bag leaders. Do we have any conscience left about it? Or have we so calloused and hardened our hearts these days that it really doesn't matter? David had such a conscience about it. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he's the anointed of the Lord. In other words, that man might be a scumbag right now, the way he's carrying on, but he's still the guy in charge. He's still the guy in charge. And I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. David references the worthiness of the position. He's God's anointed. Not necessarily the worthiness of the one who was holding it. Look at what Daniel says about authorities. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, Daniel said this, that he changes, speaking of God, he changes times and seasons. He, being God, deposes kings and raises up others. Who puts kings down? He says it's God ultimately. Who raises up another king? He says it's God ultimately. You can read the story and you can work out who put them up and who put them down. But he says the ultimate authority is God and God raises them up and God brings them down. In Daniel 4.32, he says this, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. He says that, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be driven away from people and you're going to live with wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge this. And what's he going to acknowledge? Acknowledge this. The Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms. Say all kingdoms. All kingdoms. I wonder if that means Australia. Or are we this separate little thing away here, away from all the other kings? Now he says all kingdoms. He is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and he gives them to anyone he wishes. Anyone he wishes. Ultimately, God is in control. 
We may not always be able to respect the leader, but we do need to respect the position. Why? Well, put simply, because Scripture teaches us that authority is God's idea. Authority is God's idea. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. I told you I was going to throw a lot of Bible verses at you today, okay? Not normally this much, but I want to get this across. Romans 13, 1 to 2. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. I don't see an exclusion there for myself. But anyway, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Alan, stop whinging when the police find you for doing the wrong thing. Stop justifying it and trying to get away from it. That's what it says to me. I'm not sure what it says to you. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which who? God, God is what? There is no authority. There's no authority except that which God himself has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. This is Romans. Who's the emperor at the time? Nero. And he's saying, even though Nero is there, he's acknowledging, I know Nero is there, but I also know this. If God didn't want Nero to be there, he wouldn't be there. If God didn't allow Nero to be there, I don't care who votes for the guy, he ain't going to be there. And if God wants somebody else to be there, I don't care who votes against him, guess what? He's going to be there. So in the sovereignty of God, he knows things we don't know. He knows things we don't know. And we need to learn to trust God. Ultimately, he's the ultimate one in authority and in control. And we trust God. We learn to trust God. Consequently, watch this. Whoever rebels against the authority is what? Rebelling against who? God. You're rebelling against God. You're rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Who's he writing to again? church he's writing to christians he's telling us a couple of things there's no authority there that was not as, uh, that has not been established unless god wants it there yes i'm including nero the guy that's burning us at the stakes and feeding us to lions i'm saying that to you romans he's there if god doesn't want him there he can, it's the power to get rid of him but if he's there then somehow for some reason god has ultimately allowed that to happen and it says if we rebel against that we're actually rebelling against something that god has instituted notice again he doesn't make it personal he talks about the position not the person, doesn't he? He doesn't talk about Nero. He talks about the position of authority. He says that's what we've got to acknowledge. These positions of authority are put there for a reason. You may feel like you're rebelling against a law or a leader or a government, but the fact is we're actually rebelling against something that God has instituted when we move in rebellion. Whether we like the authorities over our life or not is our decision. We're not told we have to like them, but we are told we need to learn to submit. John chapter 19, verse 9 to 11. Jesus, when he's standing before Pilate, here's what he said. It says, he went back inside the palace. This is Pilate. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize, this is Pilate, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And look at Jesus' answer to him. You would have how much power? You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Pilate, you do whatever. But I know this. I'm standing before you knowing this. You've got zero power other than the power that he allows you to have. How freeing is that to be in that position? To just be able to go, hey, God, I know that ultimately you're in control. I trust you. I trust you. Pilate had only that which was given to him from above. So if we're called to submit, here's the question that's on everyone's heart. If we're called to submit, then why would God allow corrupt and evil authority? Here's some thoughts. One of the reasons I believe that God allows it is because people actually want the leadership they get. A lot of cases, we want the leadership that we get. I want you to have a think about um, Saul. God is leading the nation of Israel through Samuel the prophet. Through prophetic pr prophets were speaking the word of God and leading the nation. The nation came to Samuel and said, we want a king like all the other nations. What they were saying was all these other nations have got guys, big buff guys with swords that are military leaders leading them. We want that kind of a leader. And so Samuel goes to God and God goes, well, here's the deal. If they get a leader, here's what this leader is going to do. You can go and read it yourself. He says that your leader is going to take your people. He's going to make them servants. He's going to, make them, he's going to do all this. And, and God paints this ugly, terrible picture of what's going to happen if you get a king. If you get this king, here's what he's going to do. Samuel goes back to the people and goes, let me just tell you what God said. You can have a leader, but here's what he's going to do to you. And what happens? The nation goes, we don't care. We want it. And what does God do? He goes, okay. 
If that's the leadership that you want, I'll graciously give you that leadership. Now, here's the thing. I don't believe that every single Israelite said, yes, we still want him. I believe there would have been a people there that would have gone, um, if God says a bad idea, <laughs> we're sticking with God. Right? Not everybody would have said, yes, bring it on. We want our kids to be taken advantage of. We want them to become slaves. They've got to learn how to work anyway and they won't listen to us. Not everybody would have been on that boat. There would have been many people there that said, no, 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 we want to go with God. But guess what? Almost like a democratic vote. God goes, but most of you want this, then I'm going to give you that leadership. And I believe that nations, in many cases, we get the leadership that we want. And so God in his grace and sovereignty, he's still in control, but he allows us to have the leadership that we want. There's another reason why I think sometimes that God allows corrupt and evil leaders and authority. It's because the church is called to shine a light. And light shines brightest in the darkest places. You think about places right now where the church is flourishing, where the church is growing exponentially, where signs and wonders and miracles are taking place, where churches are being planted. You think about it right now. It's happening in some of the darkest places so far removed from the freedoms and liberties that we take for granted as a Western church. And yet God is doing amazing things and their lights are shining so brightly because the places in which they live are so dark. See, the church is light in the West. It hasn't really needed to shine too brightly for a long, long time in this country because we've been friends with the world and we've been able to play in the same playground together and we've been one best buddy, one best buddy. And our government takes care of people to a pretty large degree. We look, we look after people that don't have jobs. We look after the poor. We, our government is pretty good when it comes to welfare and caring, so much so that some people say we're a welfare state. Because we do such a good job compared to other nations of the earth. We lived in India, trust me, they don't have anything like that over there. Nothing like that over there. We are so well looked after here. There's a lot of light. So I I wonder sometimes whether God, maybe with some things that are happening and it seems to be getting darker and darker, if I I trust you and I believe, Lord, that whatever's happening, God, for whatever reason, your sovereignty, you're allowing certain things to happen at a leadership level. And even if the place gets a little bit darker, God, I'm looking at that going, well, God, maybe that's an opportunity for us as a church to shine a brighter light than we've shone in the past. Maybe it's time for us to stand up and we can start to shine that light of Jesus a little bit more because light shines its brightest in the darkest of places. And we've had it pretty good. The church is to display the love of God, the goodness of God, the compassion of God, the heart of God in the earth. The world's not called to do that. We are. This is where people have seen God in the church throughout history, in the darkest of places. The church started schools when when only a certain type of person was allowed to be educated. The church said, no, everybody should get educated. The church started hospitals when when hospital care wasn't there for everybody, when sick people were thrown in the streets, when orphans and kids were left to die because they were deformed. It was the church that gathered them in and started all these facilities and these institutions to care for those kinds of people. In the darkness, the light shone so incredibly brightly. When there's places where there was no welfare, we fed people. We looked after widows and we looked after orphans when nobody else did. And here's the thing, as Christians we need to understand we will never have perfect authority on earth until the one who wields perfect authority returns. We will never have it until the one that carries all authority on his shoulders comes back. We will never have a perfect enough world to satisfy the hearts of most Christians. We always want better. We always want more liberty, more freedom, more this, more that. We're looking to the wrong places. Ultimately, that's going to happen the other side of this existence. We're we're not in the place where that's even a believable option at the moment. We need to understand we'll never have perfect authority on earth until the one who wields perfect authority returns. And we need to stop criticizing the authorities and governments for not bringing heaven to earth because there's only one who has the capacity to bring heaven to earth, and that is Jesus. Nobody else. In the meantime, what do we do? Well, Paul encourages us. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 4. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. All those in authority. Imagine this. Imagine if Australians prayed for their leaders as much as we whinged and criticized them. 
Imagine if every time you had a critical thought about Anthony Albanese, instead of whinging and complaining, what if you took that thought, went to God and said, I'm going to turn that into a prayer and I'm going to pray for his salvation. Imagine how much prayer would be going up for our leaders if instead of whinging and criticizing, we took that same amount of energy and time and we prayed for them. We prayed for them. If we're marinating in current culture, if we're being conformed to the pattern of this world, guess what? I'll guarantee you this. There's very little prayer going on and a lot of complaining. But if we're going to renew our minds and be transformed into the people God wants us to be, then we're called to pray. Spend some time praying for our leaders. Do I think Anthony Albanese is a great guy? I don't know him personally. Do I like the decisions they make? A lot of them I don't. Do I think they're leading us down a good path? My opinion? No, I don't. But that's my opinion. I'm not the sovereign God who for whatever reason has allowed them to be in power. But I know what I'm called to do here is to pray for them. To pray for my leaders. And to pray for those in authority. He says, first of all, pray for them, for kings and all those in authority, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Notice the focus of the prayer. It's for the leaders to come to know Jesus. Because the best chance the church have of living a peaceful and quiet and godly life is if its leaders are Christian and are favorable towards the church. So the whole focus of this prayer here, what he's praying in this passage, wonderful, he's saying pray for your leaders to get saved. Because if you have Christian leaders, well, it's going to make things a bit easier for you, isn't it? But notice what the focus of the prayer is not. It's not so that you as a church can have a more comfortable existence. That's not, what he's, that's not the focus. I think sometimes we have this incredible preoccupation with being comfortable and safe. and We think that that's what God owes us. God owes us leadership that will make us safe and bow to our every whim. And, hey, we live in a world that is decrepit by sin. And the promise of God is that there is a perfect world awaiting us, but it will never be this one. It won't be here, people. If you follow Jesus, it won't ever be here. Get rid of it. It's a pipe dream and a fantasy to think that we can just push back far enough and get everyone to do everything we want and we can have heaven here on earth. It's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. That's just the reality. See, the focus is not on creating a more comfortable environment for believers. Now, why? Why is the focus not to make it more comfortable here? It's very simple, because we're not of this world. It's not our home. We're aliens and strangers, or as Peter puts it, foreigners and exiles. Back to where we started. 1 Peter 2.11 Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles... An exile is somebody that's not living in the place that's actually their home. A foreigner is somebody that's living in a place that's not actually their home. And he says to the church, he says, you guys need to realize this. You need to have a little bit of an attitude adjustment here. You're living in somebody else's place. You're living in somebody else's place. Anyone ever travel internationally? Pete and Cheryl? And you break up a big flight, you land in an airport in Bangkok or Osaka or whatever. And you're in that airport layover lounge. And while you're there, guess what? You've got to obey the laws of that airport and do whatever you've got to do there. But while you're there, you've got a certain attitude about you, don't you? What is that attitude? Hey, this ain't my home. I'm just passing through here. I'm just passing through here. This ain't my, this ain't my home. This ain't my final destination. Tell you what, that, that, you could preach, we could preach a year on that alone. Imagine what that would do for your budget. Imagine what that would do for the amount of toys you feel like you need to have, the amount of clothes you need to have in your cupboard. Imagine what that would do for the amount of things that moth and rust are going to destroy. Imagine what that would do, just that very thought, that this earth is not my home. I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here. I'm going to love it while I'm here. I'm going to love the people. I'm going to... But, but everything I do, I'm very, very aware that I'm not living for success down here. I'm living for success up there. I'm just passing through people. And so are you. We're aliens and strangers. In Hebrews chapter 11, when the writer of Hebrews talks about the great heroes of the faith, he says this, all these people were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers. Where? On earth. If you seem weird to the rest of the world, it's because you probably are. You're a foreigner. You're a stranger. Your customs are different. Your ways are different. Some translations say aliens and strangers. Please don't go putting tinfoil on your head. The point is this is not our home. I'm going to move on really, really quickly. I've got a couple of minutes to go. So here's the thing. We need to obey authorities 
Not so they'll make life more comfortable for us down here, but because our ultimate authority calls us to. Amen? God calls us to. Finally, is there ever any cause for disobedience to authority? Some people have been sitting there waiting. You shut off at the start. Now you've just opened up. Here's the answer emphatically. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Andy Stanley, uh, 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 author and pastor, he said this once. He said, are they in charge and are they asking me to sin? Are they in a position of authority over me? Because then I'm going to do it. Unless it's sin and then I'm not. Unless it's sin and then I'm not. When is it okay to say no? When you're being asked to disobey what God is saying. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 21. We all know the story. Moses is going to be born and Pharaoh comes and says, we want you to kill an entire generation of, of children. And what do the Hebrew midwives do? They say no. It's an interesting story, that one, because they actually, not only did they not do it, but they told a lie to Pharaoh. They said, oh, these women, they just, they, 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 they get a birth pang and boom, the baby comes out like it's coming down a slippery slide. It just happens so quick, we can't even get there. They lied to Pharaoh. But the reason it says they did it because they feared God. Because they feared God, they said, we can't do that. So is it okay at times to disobey? Yes, it is. These guys said, we're not going to destroy that which is made in the very image of God. Daniel chapter 3. We've got another one in the fire. Those boys there, and they're told that you can only worship this big statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And what do they do? They say, no, I'm sorry, we can't. We can only worship one God. We're not allowed to worship statues. We worship one God. And they said, no. And Pharaoh, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, well, we'll throw you in a fire. They went, that's okay. You can do that. Because our God's big enough to get us out of it. But even if he doesn't, God's sovereign, it's fine. If he lets us burn to cinder, that's fine. While we're here, we're still going to worship only one God. So if, if the government or authorities or anyone is telling you to worship something other than God, yep, I believe we should say, no, we won't do that. Daniel chapter 6. There's this decree passed. And, and the decrees for 30 days, no one can pray to any God. You can only pray to the king. And so Daniel decides, well, I'm going to keep praying three times a day like I always do, but I'm praying to Yahweh because that's the one I pray to. I don't pray to anybody else. And they come and jump down on him and we all know about the story of the lion's den and so on. But here's the thing. If I get asked to pray to any other God, I'm not going to do it. If I get asked to taint the image of God, I'm not going to do it. If I get asked to bow to anything other than Jesus, I'm not going to do it. Acts chapter 5, verse 28 to 29. The apostles are preaching the gospel. They get told not to preach the gospel anymore. And their response to the authorities at the time was this. You decide amongst yourself whether it's better to obey God or obey man. As for us, we're going to obey God. If I get told I can't preach the gospel, I'm not going to obey that. I'm going to keep speaking about Jesus. And I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Because that is going against God. So is it okay to disobey earthly authorities? Yes, it is. When obeying earthly authorities means clearly disobeying God, then disobedience is necessary. But here's the thing for us as Christians. Just be sure you're sitting close enough to God to know the difference. You know one, one thing that came out of COVID? How much of the restrictions and how much we were told to do was actually anti-God? How many people stood because God's word said? How many people just dug their heels in because of a rebellious spirit? Or because as a church we feel like we submit to nobody? It's amazing the attitudes and things that came up during that period. I'm not judging anyone. I'm not saying that this was right and that was wrong. I'm just saying this. There wasn't a lot of things that we were asked to do during that couple of years that really went against the word of God. Yet still churches wanted to stand up and give a fist to the government. It's between them and God. And I'm just saying, make sure that we're sitting close enough to Jesus to know the difference in those moments. See, as Christ followers, the ultimate criteria for what's right and wrong is not whether the prevailing authorities command it, but whether God commands it. You see, we get the opportunity as believers to choose submission. And when you choose submission, you actually become a servant. You actually become a servant. Instead of being forced into submission, that makes you a slave. I'd rather be a servant than a slave. We need to let go of the fear of looking like doormats. Some of us are too worried about being doormats. We're not going to be pushed over by anybody. Well, that's very much, you're marinating in the way of the world if you're thinking that. Let this mind be upon you, Philippians says. Christ who humbled himself even to the death of a cross. Do we want to walk the way that Jesus calls us to walk or do we want to be a blend? It's our call. It's up to us. God's not forcing any of us. Whether it's parents, whether it's teachers, whether it's your employer, law enforcement, whether it's the government, we need to understand that authority structures exist. 
they're a good idea and they're God's idea. There are times to push back against them, but we need to look at the word of God and say, God, is this a moment? Or Lord, is this a moment for me to humble myself and just submit? Just because we've been hurt by authority or we've seen authority abused or we've been on the wrong side of some decisions, none of this removes the place authority holds over our lives. And none of this removes our call to submit to that authority. Hey, I'm just going to get... Um, I might get Jasper. Where's Jasper? Jasper, do you want to jump up on the guitar for us, mate? Go solo for us? You did awesome this morning. That was amazing. That was great. It was great. Hey, here's what I want to do. I just want to open up the front this morning. I want to pray for anybody. But if you want to come up just as a sign of surrender in your own heart to God, I reckon this is hard. I don't know about you, but I'm preaching this and I'm, in the back of my mind I'm arguing with myself, making up all these reasons and justifying, telling myself why I'm full of, you know what. But I'm looking at it in the Word of God going, oh, I can see something here. I see, I see a culture of believers being told that this act of submission, standing with God, there's something powerful about it in the midst of a culture that is so anti-Christian it's not funny. And if he's telling these people you still need to do it, I'm looking at me today going, well, Alan, come on, stop, stop whinging. Stop pushing back. Stop trying to get around it. All you children here, submit to your parents. It's a godly thing. It's a godly thing. And I know some of you don't want to do it, and I know some of you want to push, but I'm encouraging you to learn submission at home with a mum and dad that love you and care for you. Because God calls you to. Anyone that goes to work, submit to your employer. God calls you to do it. You might not like their ideas. You might feel like you've got better ideas. That's completely fine. I'm not saying you don't. But I'm saying at the end of the day, if they say do this and it doesn't go against God, hey, make their life easy and do it. Do it. In a world that is so anti-authoritarian and so anti-leadership, how hard do you think it is for people in authority who are leaders these days? I sat down with a young girl sometime uh, back with another church we were at. And um, she was not living, probably to the standard of godliness that she should have been living. And so me and my wife sat down, and we had a chat. And all we did was point out, hey, the Word of God says this. And you hold a bit of a position here, so we're kind of holding you to that. And it was a very amicable conversation. Hey, are you struggling with this? You having some wins and losses? They went, yes, yeah, some wins, some losses. Yeah, we understand. It's really hard for people your age. This person, when I say young person, they're an adult, by the way. Anyway, we thought the conversation went well. The next day I get a phone call from one of the parents absolutely ripping me. How dare, how dare I hold up this biblical standard and go, hey, I thought all I did was, you're a Christian. I'm just pointing out what the Bible says. If you want to be in these positions, there's this, we didn't attack, we didn't get angry. It's really, really hard. If you're a leader or a, or a person in authority these days, it's really, really hard to address anybody. Because the minute you say something or look sideways at somebody, you're in trouble. And you know what? We can make life easier. As Christians, we can, make, we, we can be the kind of people that leaders and authorities go, you know, we love leading them. We actually love leading These guys get it. We, these guys get it. They make our job easier. And unfortunately, that's not always the testimony. I want to open up the front. And all I want to do is say this. If you want to do some business with God, come on up. No one's going to, I don't want anyone praying for anyone this morning. The getting up and coming forward is just an act of humility and submission between you and the Lord. I want you to come up and ask God for healing if you've been hurt by authority. If you have a distrust for authority, bring it to God. Because if you don't, it's like a cancer. It'll stay inside you and you'll keep festering over it and you'll keep spewing out this and spewing out that. You'll harden your heart to the point where we're no, we're no longer like David. David cut that hem off and he had a conscience straight away. He said he was conscience stricken. Most of us, we don't care anymore. That's a sign of a hardened heart. It's a sign of a hardened heart. Come up and ask God for healing. Ask God for strength to submit. Because it's not always easy, I know that. Ask God for the freedom from that need to be against. Some people just have this need to be against all the time. Doesn't matter what, you, what, what your boss did, you always got to push back. It's like this inbuilt rebellious knee. I've got to be against everything. Well, that's not good for you, and it's not good for the people that are trying to lead you. Ask God to set you free from the inability to submit because it's actually tiring. Repent of any wrong attitudes towards authorities and ultimately receive forgiveness from God into your life. 
Because God wants to set us free to ultimately trust him. And he wants us to be able to enter into that rest of faith. So if that's you, this is all we're going to do. I'm going to get Jasper to just keep playing. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, tea and coffee next door. So if you need to go, we've gone, we've gone a little over time today. I apologize for that. I don't like to go over time. I do apologize. But again, we've only got another couple of weeks of this series and then we're going to tie a bow around it and we'll move on to some other things. But through that door there, tea and coffee. I just want to pray for us. But if God's speaking to you this morning, just come forward and you just do business with God. You do business with God. Let's all stand. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, I thank you that ultimately, God, we, Lord, we, we, we know things that the world doesn't know. God, we know that no matter who's in charge or what's happening, there is a God in heaven who has ultimate control. Father, you created the world. You set things in motion. God, you have a time frame. You've got to come back one day, Lord. And it doesn't matter what governments think, what man thinks. It doesn't matter what laws are passed. Nothing's going to stop you coming back. You're going to come back one day. And we're going to be with you one day. And we'll leave this place. But while we're here, Father, you call us to live a certain way. And so, Father, I pray right now for every person in this room. Lord, if there are attitudes in our heart, if there are... Uh, are things, Lord, that, we, that, 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 that are stopping us from walking in submission to those authority structures above us. Authority structures that you have put in place. God, if we've been hurt in the past, Lord, would you bring healing? But Lord, I just pray this morning, if there's anyone you're speaking to here, Lord, that you would give them the courage and the boldness and that as they come forward, that you would meet them here and you would do whatever it is that you want to do with them this morning, Father. And I ask this, right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. If that's you, if the Lord's speaking to you, feel free to come forward. Otherwise, take coffee next door, head off, whatever it is that you've got to do. Bless you guys.